Welcome back to our latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, the president of Dale Cunningham Training Tokyo, Japan. My special guest today is an old friend of mine, Eric Wiedemeyer, who is the president of Tactus. Eric, great to see you. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks, Greg. Great. Yeah, great to see you. You know, you've been here a long time. How many years altogether now, Eric? Oh, geez. I came here in 1980, so... Right. It's getting on to some years, yeah. It's getting up there. So tell us the backstory. You know, how did you get to Japan? What have you been doing? And then we'll dig into some of the leadership parts. Okay. Uh, before I, I was uh, in Taiwan for a few years. Uh, that's sort of where I wandered after I went to school. And I was uh, brushing up my Chinese there and got into some newspaper work. And at some point, I don't know, Japan seemed like the next logical step, so I, I washed up here. Uh, I started out in a little tiny PR company working for them, and then I started working in magazines. We did uh, in-flight magazines like the JAL in-flight magazine, some hotel magazines. So you what, you're writing articles or doing editorial? Or editorial, uh, editing mainly, yeah. Okay. And then got into some advertising work with that company. And then I moved to an advertising agency where I was a writer for a while, and I was at, there for a long time. Uh, so I was in advertising for most of my time here. But writing? writing well, I was writing, writing at first, and then I, was, then I was creative director. And then I became the, the head of the strategic marketing group there. And also uh, be, uh, headed up the uh, interactive unit. We had a kind of a spin-off interactive company at the agency, and I headed that one as well. So this is a, a Japanese agency? Uh, run by a gaijin, but, but a Japanese agency. Right, OK. Yeah. So pretty pretty medium size, small size, large size? Well, for, you know, for, for foreign type agencies, you'd call it medium. Mm -hmm. We were of a comparable size with the, you know, the international agencies present in Japan. Right, OK. They're, they're all pretty small here, right? Right, OK. But, but compared to a big Japanese agency, we were nothing, of course. Right, 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 right. And so were you uh, in that, in that uh, agency when you were sort of going from writing to creative director, et cetera, et cetera, at what point did you start running teams, being responsible for other people as oh, a manager? Oh, well, at the creative director stage, yeah. When you are creative director. Sure. And how many people were you looking after? Um, oh, well, at the beginning, I don't know, half a dozen or more, and then later on it got to be 20, 30. And this is pre-bubble? Yeah, yeah. So it must have been... Pre-enduring. Pre yeah, yeah pre-enduring. must have been pretty good times in the pre-bubbles that built, built up to the bubble. Yeah, it was kind of okay. Yeah. yeah, for the advertising business. Oh, God, so, uh, lots of fun. Yeah, so, you know, uh, you've come from Taiwan, out of school, you're in Japan. This is, must be early 80s, mid-80s, is it? I came here in 1980 to Japan. 1980 yeah. itself, right. Okay, so at that time, what were some of the things that struck you when you started to lead a team of Japanese at the agency? Well, they weren't all Japanese, for one thing, okay. but most of them were. Uh, oh, just that uh, you needed a lot of, a lot of clarity. Uh, in, 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 you know, people would, uh, you know, a reluctance to do new things or different things, you know, that, that sort of experience everybody has here. And so you just have to jolly people along and... Was that because they looked at you and said, well, he's pretty young, he's been in Taiwan, so what, Taiwan's not Japan, uh, why should we follow this guy? Was it that type of thing or was it just that? Well, it wasn't resistance so much in that, in that sense. It's just they have their ways of doing things and they just like to do them that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't age, it was uh, mostly being a gaijin. I mean, the advertising we were doing was in Japanese. Right. And so I never, you know, I, and I was hands off of that. I would never judge Japanese you know, advertising copy for, for mm -hmm. beauty, mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would look at it for, you know, being strategically on point, mm -hmm. uh, which was my job later on. That's why I, I kind of left the creative thing and went into strategy because I had really no business being a creative director in a Japanese agency. It was silly. Right. Right. And how long was it before you went into the strategic side? I can't remember exactly when that happened. It was, I was doing the other stuff for a good 10 years, I suppose. Okay. Well, that's a substantial period of time writing and creative side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so when you when you moved across from the creative side to the strategic side, were there any any other challenges that came up? Because you now got a little bit of a different type of group. I imagine creatives, inverted commas, uh, Maybe herding cats is a good uh, metaphor. I don't know, or it's not like well, that. Well, no, it was, we we were we got it pretty organized. See, when I was on the strategy side, I was still, in a sense, 
in charge of, of the creative group. I wasn't, oh, I, I, wasn't I, I wasn't their line manager or anything else, okay. anything else, but I had kind of approval rights on anything that came through because it had to be passed off by strategy. And also I wrote, wrote all the briefings. So I was in there at the beginning and then again at the end on right. the approval side. So I was pretty well involved in creative the whole time. Right, okay. And they were used to me being in creative. So it, right. was, a, it was a, it was not a, a real strong transition when I moved into strategy mm. actually. Mm. And what were some other challenges you found in, you know, going, this is presumably, you know, you're probably first time to be leading a Japanese team. So what were some other things that sort of came up? You've mentioned a couple. I'm just wondering yeah, if there's some more. Um, it was pretty smooth. Uh, advertising is is a pretty collaborative sort of a business. Uh, right. You know, we would discuss things together and come to some sort of a consensus. Usually, the way you do in Japan, mm -hmm. you, know, you just have to listen to people a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the st strategy side, you know, you just they they trusted me to 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 make those calls correctly because they knew that things had to get through the Gaijin marketing people on the client side. And they figured I understood those people better than they did, which I did. And uh, so there was some, some trust built up there. Um, mm. And so, you know, if I had something to say, they were, they had open ears usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was 10 years altogether in that company. I was, no, I was at that company over 20 years. 20 years? Altogether, okay, yeah. I didn't realize it was that long. Right, yeah. okay. So that's been here a long time. You know, yeah, <laughs> I know. You're a good man. You've been here for a long time, which is good. So what's, what happens next? Where do you go from there? Uh, well, the, the agency closed after the Lehman shock. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Our last office was about two doors down. Oh, really? Uh, and yeah. just down this neighborhood here in Akasaka? Oh, yeah, another like neighborhood, yeah. You're on the other side of the street near? No, no, right? literally two doors down mm. that way. Um, but uh, so that closed, and I so so then I opened up uh, Tactus, and I uh, wasn't quite sure what the company was doing when I started because it was like, oops, got to do something, you know. You, right. So you open up something, and it started out being kind of mixed communications and strategy, but I quickly, uh, you know, the, the 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 world didn't need that many more communications companies. You know, I didn't want to, and I really didn't want to be in the advertising business anymore. So I uh, moved into the strategy side, which, which to me meant the branding side. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what Tactus, Tactus does. So it's, it's brand strategy. So I guess you start as a, a one-man band yourself, yeah. and then gradually you're starting to get people to come and help you. You're using yeah, them as... Tactus, Tactus is, is still mostly me. I have a small team that I work small with. Small team, right. Okay. Uh, but the, but the, the real heavy-duty you know, strategic work tends to be done by me and, and the people helping. Right. So uh, that's not a what I would call a, a huge leadership challenge, you know. No. Except that, uh, you know, working with the clients, uh, proper branding in, in my sense of branding. Uh, it's, it's not, I'm not talking about marketing branding. I'm talking about strategy. It's like who we are, why we're here. You know, that basic, basic fundamental stuff that, that you have to do with a company. Uh, that's heavily involved with leadership in the client companies. It's a really important part of, of leadership to me. Right. And that's what I, I try to get across to these people. It's, you know, if they, if they get the branding right, it'll get their leadership, uh, make the leadership a whole lot easier. Right. A lot more effective. And I'm thinking that, you know, when you are with a, a company that's been established for a long time and for them to recruit people is relatively straightforward in those days, there's plenty of people to recruit too. But today, you know, uh, when you're a one-man band starting out and you're starting to get people to come and join you as a small company, how, did you find that challenging? Did you find it hard to convince people, convince their parents and their grandparents to let them come and join this, uh, this relatively small company? Well, I mean, you know, I don't hire a lot of full-time employees. I, I, okay. Most of the people that work with me are, are sort of part-time or, right. or, or something else. Now, I have this other company. Mm -hmm. uh, so that this is a bit more recent. I opened Tactus a little over 10 years ago. Right. And starting about three or four or five years ago, I got started with another company called J Global. I'm a right. managing director there, and that's sort of uh, con uh, it's a learning management and consulting, and it's all about helping Japanese companies globalize. And that's got that's a, a, a bigger company. We, we have, you know, I don't know, 20, 25 people, but... Uh, most of those people aren't full-time either. Oh, okay. 
Uh, we've got, I think, five full-time employees, but the rest are, are, uh, are contract or part-time. We've got, it's, it's a really interesting... The gig economy. Kind of. It's, it's, it's a bit postmodern, yeah. It's not quite a virtual company, but it's, it's, it's uh, interestingly put together. So it's, it's a very, very diverse group. We have people from, I don't know, 12 different countries wow. in, 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 with that small number of people from all over the place. Mm. And uh, that's, that's sort of interesting. If you want to mm. talk about herding cats, that's... You know. That's the herding cats part. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in your experience of uh, working here all that time, which I'm just adding the numbers up here. That's got to be getting close to 40 years plus, right? Yeah, I know, so I'm 36, so you're, you're more than me. But what have you found? Uh, some of the things which have worked well in terms of getting teams engaged, be they full-time staff, which is, you know, a salary point, you know, obligation, but also with people who are part-time, where there's they're not full-time employees, they're in the, you know, uh, gig economy, so to speak, getting those people engaged. What have you found that's worked well to get people engaged in Japan? Well, having a, having a, a direction to go in is, is pretty important. That's that, mm -hmm. that purpose piece, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, that's what my branding experience kind of taught me is that that's, that's sort of important, you know, for a company. It gives people a, a target to aim at. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps with engagement a whole lot. And then beyond that, it's, it's kind of getting... Getting people to do stuff, you know, you, you, I mean, they're, they're doing stuff with their job, but sometimes, uh, you know, you, you look for, for ways to, to activate people. I mean, it, there's an example, of, this isn't my company, this is one of my client companies with the, with the branding business. You know, we, we did the branding piece and said, okay, what, are, what is our company about? What's our promise to the customer? All of that thing. And I said, well, you know, your next step is to get your your workforce involved in that proposition, get them to understand it and sort of live it. And, uh, you know, I was talking about, you know, getting some little programs where the, uh, you know, formalized ways of getting the, the, uh, the, the workforce to think about these things. And the shot show of this company ran, what, took that ball and ran way ahead of me with it. And what we ended up doing was presentations by everybody in the company, and this is a manufacturing, Japanese manufacturing company with a few thousand people, factories here and there in Japan, and everybody in the company, not individually, in teams, small teams, made a presentation on how to, what we call operationalize the brand, or you know, how to, within their small department, you know, it's dealing with machines in a factory, right? But how, how, how can we better deliver this, this promise to the customer? And they all prepared and made these formal presentations, and the shot show was at every one of them. There were dozens of these things. I was at them too, because my my company helped uh, facilitate these 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 things. But uh, it a got the got the people thinking about what the company was all about. B it gave them face time with the shot show, which they don't get all that much. Uh, a direct uh, opportunity to say what they thought and, and give their ideas to the shot show who was listening visibly. And that was just tremendously motivating across the whole mm. company. It was uh, you know, more, more than I hoped for. Oh, uh, months. Months. Wow. Okay. Oh, Big we, we, this went on for like six months. Wow. All right. You know, uh, it was it was room f rooms full of people, one after the other. That's a pretty good contract for you there. I kind of like the sound of months of that. Oh yeah, well, it, it was work. good. Yeah, and and uh, like like I said, it was way beyond what I had envisioned doing with these people. Mm. But uh, credit to them, my goodness, they they just they just uh, took this thing and, and ran with it. It was just very very good, mm. and uh, great for the company uh, on on all sorts of different levels. It's the engagement. It's yep. the understanding of the direction. Yep. They got good innovation out of it. Yeah. You know, you, you talk about, you mentioned innovation before. Right? How do you get Japanese people to innovate? Well, you ask them to innovate. Yeah. And they'll do it. Yeah. And, and you listen to them when they get the ideas. So. Often, you know, we, we go into companies and they'll have beautifully framed, you know, vision, mission, values on the wall and uh, all looks pretty good. And uh, you take it off the wall and you turn it around so they can't see it. Then you, you got like 30 managers. You ask them, what's the vision of the company? Yeah, it's Nobody. They haven't done it right. What's the mission? Nobody. 
30 people collectively usually have about five values, probably get three. Yeah. And I just think to myself, okay, up in the executive suite, they're all thinking that people understand the mission values, you know, the, yeah. the, the direction here, the vision, and they're living their lives at work according to that and they're, you know, all working in harmony. But the reality is it's not happening. So that example you gave is very interesting to show what the sort of effort you need to really drive that yeah. into the team to make them own it. Actually. Well, that's, that, that's the activity. But, but before that happens, getting the brand formulation right, which means making it really, really, really simple, mm -hmm. is, is what drives that whole thing. So what you do is you, you, you don't have eight species of brands. You don't have, we have a mission and we have a, a this and we have a proposition. And we, you know, the, in the branding business, you, you can get into this taxonomy of statements, which just get ridiculous. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, angels on a pinhead sort of a thing. Uh, but what you want to do is boil it down to one simple promise. I mean, my, my, my definition, definition of a brand, which I stole from a guy named Kevin Walker. <laughs> He's a brand guy in the States is a, a brand is a promise kept. Mm. Simple. That's it, yeah. And what you do is you make a, a promise that we're going to give to our consumer. You make it in one simple sentence, and that's it. Mm. That's all people have to remember. They don't have to remember lists of missions and this and that. Mm. And then what you do is you turn that, that thing into a que uh, that question, in, uh, uh, that statement, that promise into a question. And, you know... Uh, well, give me an example. What do you mean by that? Okay, you know, our, our, our mission is to turn people blue. All right. Just as an example. Uh, what, then you make what, what I call a strategic question. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, you get your people to ask this question about everything that they do, no matter mm -hmm. where they are in the company and what mm -hmm. they're doing. Does this make people blue? Right. Right. How could I, how could I change what I'm doing to make people bluer? Right. And, and it's that simple. Mm. All you, and if everybody in the company is thinking that and how to how to answer that one question mm. from you know a thousand different directions, right? People in, in receiving and people in the accounting department and people in product planning and they're all but they all got that one question. Mm. Uh, it, it really gets the company moving into into one direction, and so that's that's where this this uh, presentation thing I, I just talked about started. Right. It started with that one simple question. So when they made these presentations, they were all answering one question, right? And, wow, and that's it, amazing. And it, really got them focused. And this, uh, this Shacha, this president, like for example, you have two varieties of president in Japan. You have the founder, owner, president, and then you have the come up through the ranks or brought in from outside, you know, president. Yeah. So was he the owner founder type or was he the- Well, what, it, what it is type? is a next, second or third generation second owner founder. Second or family owned business, right? A young woman, in fact, in this case. Sorry? A youngish woman in this case. Oh, a youngish woman. Okay, right. Who, but who is the daughter of? The daughter of the. You know, her, her name's on the on the sign. You know. Right. Okay. So is that? Do you think um, what she did was easier for her to do because the sort of when you've got that family business control over the company, it's a little bit different to a company that's listed or even a privately held company that's a corporate. Mm. Do you think that that makes a difference or not? Some. Some, yeah, uh, you know, th this company is listed, by the way. But, but which, what I think you find in Japan is that a, a leadership position like that is kind of served up, you know what I mean? Uh, you, no, you know, I don't you, know what you, does you, served you, up mean? Well, you have a position, and it's, it's like on your little nameplate and on your desk, or it's on your meishi, and, that, and that's what you are. And people kind of give you credit for, for that level of leadership mm -hmm. right off the bat. And they almost have to because, you know, at, at the middle levels, people are cycling in and out of these positions all the time. And when they come into the position, often they have no idea how to run that department. They got mm -hmm. no experience in it. Mm -hmm. And yet they're, they're treated and, and perceived as leaders in, in, of, of that section. And so for that to happen, you have to grant a lot of... Uh, uh, sort of assumed power to the position mm. in a way that we w don't do so much in the West. And I, I think in the West we have to earn it a bit more. Mm. Uh, you know, we have to demonstrate uh, ability and leadership yeah. a bit more. But, but I'll give you my famous Yogi yeah, Berra he, quote he, he, about uh, here, leading is easy, but getting people to follow you is difficult. Exactly. And that's the problem in the West. Where's the respect 
Yeah. But here, here it kind of comes with the position a bit more. I mean, you can still screw it up if you, <laughs> if you try hard enough. But, but uh, you know, and that I think applies even to a shot shower. You know, mm -hmm. whether the shot show has his name on the on the sign or not, mm -hmm. uh, he's the shot show. Right. And you, you're, I think you're granted as you're, you know, you got some leeway there. You got some, mm -hmm. you, you got some space before you, before you lose it all. You know, <laughs> you have some stock to. To, mm. to, to play with, right? Have you seen any other examples? I mean, that's a great example of, of real engagement around one simple brand statement question. It uh, worked very well. And obviously a lot of uh, senior level commitment to really drive that into yeah. the ranks, right? To the very yeah. bottom, which that's, is just... That, that's, that's what was so impressive about that's it. That's superb, yeah. you know, that's superb. Have you seen any other things in the sort of engagement area in your own experience and the a company you worked for 20 years or in your own company about how do you get people engaged? Oh, nothing really special. I mean, you, you, you do what you do in Japan. You, you, you spend time with people. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you have to go out drinking with them a little bit and, and you know, pay some attention to, to them as people and, and, you know, listen to people, sit down with them. You know, it's, How has it gone on with COVID, though? Because we don't go out drinking with it as a team anymore. No. Nope. We don't go out for meals together anymore. Nope. We, we're all sitting at home nope. working nope. from there. So, you know, what's your reflection on what's that done for engagement? Yeah, you well, you wonder about it. Uh, at, 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 at J Global, we have uh, what well, we had. We, we just uh, modified it, but we had daily huddles right. on, on Zoom. Right. Where we all get together. Uh, we've gone to twice a week now because it was, you know, getting getting to be a bit mature. You know, a year and a half is enough to do that, right? Right. Uh, but we still do we still do them. Right. Uh, and that's been important. Uh, we, we have periodic all hands meetings on Zoom again. Mm -hmm. And we we try to liven it up. You know, it's 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 a bit of an effort. You know, it, it, it obviously looks a bit I hate to say forced, but you know, it, it, it's obviously we're making an effort, right? So we have games and prizes and oh, things okay. like really, that. You're yeah. really going for it, right? Well, yeah, yeah, you have to. Mm. I think. Why? Why do you have to? Well, because you have to. You have to kind of be with people. I, 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 you see, I'll say in Japan, but you know, I've, I've been in Asia my entire working life, so I have a, a horrible frame of reference, you know. I have no idea how American companies actually work. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not the guy to ask about. Uh, sorry. Let's, let's re, we'll just, um, let's just rewind that. Okay. <coughs> sorry. Yeah, just rewind from, I'm not the guy to ask. Sorry, ask the question again. I forgot what it was. <laughs> so, um, you know. Uh, interesting. You you use games. You oh, right, games, right, 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 right. Yeah, I was I was going to say you have what to. What sort of games? Oh, uh, I don't know. Some having to do with the business. Some just you know, guessing games. I don't know. Okay. Silly things. Um, we we, we, we do we stage. do drawing games where you have to okay. you know, guess what people are drawing. Okay. Charades, you know, right. all like all that kind of wow. stuff. Wow. Okay. Very. Yeah, you can do, you can do this stuff on Zoom. We're we're one of the things we do. We we spend a lot of time. Because uh, we do seminars and training and stuff like that, we spend a lot of time on Zoom. We become very good at Zoom, mm. engaging people at Zoom. Mm. You know, that's that's. Uh, What's the technique you use to engage people on Zoom? Because a lot of people here are on Zoom or Teams or WebEx or something yeah. uh, all the time. But most of the things I see doesn't look very engaged. So what uh, what are you finding that well, works we, in the online? When we're doing any kind of a, a, pro, a seminar or training program or, or any other kind of a seminar or webinars now, uh, we, we have, we don't have it written down, but we have in our heads kind of a time limit. This is how much time I'm allowed to talk at people. And beyond that, you have to bring people in. You have to ask them a question, have them answer in chat, go to a breakout. There are three or four or five different things that we can do. You know, you, 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 we have our little tricks, right? But you, you keep those happening. You don't, you don't sit there and drone away at people for a half hour at a time or an hour at a time. It's just so deadly. How about the, uh, the, the, the slide deck and uh, someone in a tiny box on screen Talking to you for thirty minutes—that's that what I see a lot of. Yeah, well, you, you, you just cannot do that. Just shocking. You just must not do that. Just shocking. Yeah. So, so you, you know, yeah, you got we got the slides up, but but you 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 know every ten minutes or so, you're, you're five minutes even sometimes, 
you know, what do you think about this? What's your comment on this? Mm. You know, we've got three things on the board there. Which, what's your favorite one? Why? Comment mm. on it, you know, mm. and, and get them talking. Yeah. I mean, I, we, we ran a, um, we were asked by one of our clients to run one of their training programs. This is for an international group. This is for the Middle East. So a bunch of people in everywhere from Lebanon to Mumbai, I think, you know, all along that. So a bunch of these people uh, are car dealers. And it was a, a, a training program that was designed to be, you know, a classroom training program. And, and they couldn't teach it by a classroom. And they weren't confident of being, being able to, to run it on Zoom. So they asked us to do it for them. Oh, because okay. We, That's amazing. Out of Japan. Because we knew, yeah, well, we, we know Zoom. And, and um and we know the you know we're, we we know the program we we had worked on it before we, you know it was, there was all kinds of good reasons to choose us to do it but when when we did do it we just got these people talking and right. these are these are Middle Eastern guys they did all of my well, talking I say right? Indians don't need any uh, encouragement to talk they're terrific <laughs> neither, talkers neither does anybody else in that region yeah really so uh, I would say I don't know. Between fifty and sixty percent of the of the classroom, I'm doing air quotes if you if you're listening. Uh, classroom time in in that thing were, were these guys talking to each other? Right, right. Uh, you know, they're in a big Zoom it's room. It's actually it's the opposite problem, then, isn't it? They're talking too much, and you've got to have oh, yeah, some we had, we direction had to, to where we're going with these, you know, oh, lateral yeah. conversations. We, we had to devise little tricks to shut them up. Yeah, <laughs> it's the opposite problem, right? Yeah, yeah. We, that 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 was an issue. Yeah, yeah. But but but. They came away feeling engaged, I tell you that. They didn't feel yeah. like they'd been droned at for, for three hours. No, it's interesting. I did one the other day. It was, um, what we have? We had Japan. We had, uh, we had Thailand. We had Vietnam. We had Myanmar. Uh, we had a few other countries in uh, Singapore, et cetera, all, all in one group. And, uh, you know, we're doing it in English. It's a global company, so yeah. we're doing it in English. So there's different English levels as well. But it's, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting to try and encourage people to talk but keep it on track and, and yeah. keep it tight. Uh, so, no, great. So uh, Another thing, thing we did with this group is we made uh, a WhatsApp group. Okay. You know, when we went in there, you know, we said, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're working for, it's a Japanese company, right? So we said, hey, we're, this is a Japanese company. And we explained to them the concept of the doki, right? The, 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 you know, being in the same year in the same class, coming up in companies in Japan, you come in at the same time, people in your incoming class are your doki forever. Right. And you, you guys are now doki for this program. And so forever. let's let's make a little WhatsApp group. Yeah. And we did this program last year in the beginning of this year. And I still get messages on this WhatsApp right, group. Yeah. From these, these guys. It's amazing, isn't that? You know, like I, I was. We had a, we had a function a few years ago now, and a gentleman, Japanese gentleman, came up to me and he said, uh, uh, "I did the Dale Carnegie course in 1985." I said, "Oh, that's terrific! You know, terrific." He said, "Yeah, in fact, um, my my class and I, we still meet. You know, since 1985, right?" I said, "Wow, that's incredible! In fact, we meet." We meet, uh, we meet twice a year, you know, because those dorky, those connections of the group, when you've gone through a very, very powerful experience, uh, like cement, just bonding everyone together and they want to keep that going. Like we have, uh, the Dark Honey course is 12 weeks, but people talk about the 13th week, you know. Mm. It's like the, uh, the 19th hole on the golf course, you know. It's the same thing. You have the, the next stage, the classes are finished, but they want to keep going and keep the group. That's the good thing about Japan. They're very good at that yeah. alumni type of approach. Well, that kind of circles back to what we talked about uh, quite a while ago is, is, is when you want to engage people, get them doing stuff mm. like that together. Yeah. Uh, th this uh, set of presentations for the client I told you about, at the end of their, their presentation day, they all went out to dinner, too. Of oh, great. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, that you know, created a bond among that particular group that was mm. uh, doing that together, mm. in the room together. Oh, and, and during the presentations, we did the whole World Cafe business, and so they, you know, they were doing a lot of interaction during the presentation as well. Were other were other people in the company watching the presentations, or was just that group with the no, president? Just, just that group. Just that group. Okay. So if we think about um, the other thing, you know, you've been in the creative uh, area as a professional. 
And I know that at different times growing up, I'd heard uh, Japanese great at copying, great at polishing and improving, Kaizen, of course, but they're not very creative. I had that in my head, you know, this is sort of uh, what you grew up listening, because, you know, after the war, Japanese were copying other products, the quality wasn't very good and had a bad quality image after the war. You know, and this sort of idea that Japanese aren't creative. But in my experience, and have done a lot of work with my teams in my, you know, 36 years here, and particularly since 92, when I've been living and working here, is I've always found a lot of creativity. What I've found, though, is that there are different things at work in getting the creativity to come out, and there are certain things that don't work. What's been your experience of things that work? I was just about to ask you what, you, what, what things work for you. Well, you're, 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 probably, you're the expert here. <laughs> I'll, I'll add anything that you don't cover, but I'm, I'm sure you've got better ideas than I have. What probably have you not. found um, works? Um, <coughs> well, you've you, you got to give people permission to, mm -hmm. to innovate, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have to, you know, making a mistake is a, is a is a is a serious thing in Japan, you know, and mm. and, and you have to tell them it's okay. Well, why is that? You know, you're, you're right. I mean, Japan is a no defects, no mistakes, no errors culture. Now, why is that? Why do you think? Good where question. is that coming from? Good question. I mean, what we we have a in J Global, we have a pro, program. It's it's not a language program, but it's it, what it's a program is to switch people's mindsets about language. Mm -hmm. So it's be, get comfortable using whatever level of English you already know. We don't teach mm -hmm. a, we don't teach any English. Mm -hmm. Not interested in that. But um, you know, switch your mindset around it. And and one of the points that we make is English is a language in which ten or twenty percent of the English speakers in the world are native speakers, and everybody else is non-native. And so, making mistakes in, in English is normal. Mm -hmm. It's the normal. It's, it's speaking perfect English is the weird thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And Japan isn't that way, right? Japan is mm -hmm. only spoken by nat native speakers, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so there's an expectation of perfection in language. So mm -hmm. that, but that, that little analysis doesn't necessarily apply to, to everything else, you know? No. So. Uh, is it a samurai thing, you think? Yeah. So like samurai culture was very specific about, like look at tea ceremony, right? It's very, it's very, very detailed, specific. Yeah. Like each move is choreographed, yeah. order is important, manner is important. It's very, very specific. Yeah. I know sometimes we watch these tiger dramas, the, the long year-long dramas on TV. My wife's a... Oh, I does, do all the time, yeah. She does ocha, you know, so yeah, she yeah. knows about that. And she's looking at the actors doing, he's doing that wrong or she's yeah, yeah. doing that wrong, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and I do karate, so karate is very, very specific, very detailed on it. Can only be done this way. Yeah. Can't be done any other way. So I'm just wondering, is that coming from the martial arts? I, I don't know. It could be. I mean, you, you, mm. you could blame all sorts of stuff on tea ceremony if you want to. Um, one of my, you know, everybody who's been here a long time has their little pet Nihon General, you know, theories. What one of mine is is that Japanese are very good at, at narrow, at narrow focus, and not so good at at wide focus. So that's why people stand in the middle of the street and they don't notice that they're in the way, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they're they're focused on their own little thing, and I, I think that. That that's part of the the attention to detail thing, perhaps. Mm. Just a, just an idea. I, I don't know. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the leadership training for managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? 
buy Japan Business Mastery now. So no say particular that, wisdom about When that. I first got here in uh, 1979, I went to this student conference. I hardly spoke Japanese by that time, and I just arrived. And I remember there was some discussion about how we were going to approach a topic. And they were going to go very detailed and then expand out. Uh -huh. And I was thinking going very broad and, agree, yeah. and then coming in. Yeah. And it was exactly opposite. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, one of those early first experiences where, oh, okay, they've got a 100% opposite, 180-degree yep. opposite idea to me on how things should be done. They just keep hitting that all the time the longer you live here. So, yeah, that's interesting. And I don't, I don't know why <laughs> narrow focus especially. You, know, you, have to, you don't have to explain every little thing, but uh, there is that. But, but you know, to, to, break, to break some of that, I mean, innovation, you need, to, you need to have a good balance of big picture, small picture if you're going to mm. innovate, right? Mm. Uh, Kaizen, you can be all detail, right? But, but, but real innovation, you need, you need both. And uh, we, we found that you, know, you just explicitly give people permission to, 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 to screw up. And that, I mean, that's something, isn't it? That you, and again, uh, I, had, uh, I had a boss once, uh, ex-military. Uh, he'd stand in front of the whiteboard. All the senior leaders would be there be some issue, give me ideas. All right, give me idea, Greg, give me idea. So people, you know, the, the robust, noisy people would start putting ideas out. And then he'd say, Greg, that's a stupid idea. We've done that. Uh, Derek, you're, no, no, that won't work. <laughs> give me another idea. So everyone suddenly is looking at their shoes, you know, yeah, yeah. like avoid eye contact, and it goes very quiet very quickly. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, this cannot be the best way to get ideas out of people. It's just killing people. No, it sort of so isn't. this thing about uh, giving permission to fail and have a, a crazy idea is critical to getting the ideas out. But the other point, though, is how you treat the ideas when they come out and also mm -hmm. how you treat mistakes. Because if on the one hand you say, we're going to be innovative and we're okay if there are mistakes and then something happens, you boom, you made a mistake, you know. People observe very carefully yeah. what you do, more interested in that than what you say. So I think there's a, a legitimacy there of, of consistency of yeah. what you rhetorically are saying with what you're actually doing. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with that type of thing? Well, one, one of the, the things we do at, at, at J Global when we're, when we're doing, you know, we're, we're interested in this helping Japanese companies to globalize and, and, and their, the problems they have tend to be around they're cultural basically it's the kind of thing that you talked about you know the inside out versus outside in I mean, there, there are thousands of those little things and so the problems that a company is likely to have is a the Japanese people in the company just aren't prepared to, to operate effectively in a, in a global environment culturally Second problem is the, the foreigners who have either come into to Japan in a gaishike or are working for a Japanese company, maybe abroad, have the, the reverse gaishke problem. Gaishike being a multinational Mostly, company. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, the, the, uh, they have the reverse problem. They don't understand what their Japanese colleagues are, are on about half the time. Mm. So you've got these people, two, two, two flavors of people problem. And then you have some systemic issues. Uh, there, there are various systems in Japanese companies that, that just aren't aligned with the way people do things in the rest of the world. And so, you know, simply put, it's kind of like three things. And there's a pretty wide gap. I mean, Japan really is, you know, you, you do cross-cultural studies and you, you put people on scales from different countries and all these a thousand different dimensions. And you, you see over and over that Japan is way off in left field, you know apart from everybody else. It happens over and over. Even Korea, China, the oh, yeah. oh, yeah. rest of APEX, totally different. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. oh there, there are some parts where, you know, China will be in the middle between Japan, but but, but Japan is way different from China. I mean, goodness, mm -hmm. I was, I was in, you know, I have some experience. You, you, you've had experience. Well, with I, I studied people. Chinese at university, too. And, oh, you uh, did, too? Okay, I did, so, too. So, yeah. you know, Chinese politics and history. So, yeah, I, I get the idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know. So, but, 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 so what happens is, is you've got these gaps and people just don't, 
don't, they can't cross over. And, and, and there's nothing mysterious or, or interesting about that, really. I mean, gee, there's a gap. And they, 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 but the interesting thing is, is, is why, and I've been here, you know, like you said, 40 years. Do you have the same problems now that you had 40 years ago? Why has nobody cracked this thing in all this mm -hmm. time? And uh, our theory, uh, the, the, our, as a company, Energy Global, is, is, is that the, the gap is just too wide. You've got this big old wide river, and you've got people on opposite sides, and it's just too wide a river to cross. And so our, our theory of the case is that what you do is you plunk an island in the middle of the river, and, which means sort of some sort of a hybrid system. You take good things from Japan, you take good things from the global system, and you mix them up into one system. And you have to teach each side a different set of new skills to get to the island. Hmm. But they can both get to the same island, and once they're there, they can work together. Hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's the sort of metaphorical, you know, theoretical construct. But, but we, we have lots of specific things around how to get to the island and what the island is. But a big part of it is, uh, when you're talking to Japanese people, is mindset. My, yeah, I'm sure you do bunches of this at Dale Carnegie, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mindset training is just so, so, so important. Mm -hmm. And so how you think about language, and we, I told you about that at one program, how you think about communication, how you think about treating mistakes and, and ideas, all this, you know, yes and, and, you know, all, all of these little techniques that I'm sure you do the same thing we do. We have a, we have a program where we try to eliminate the but, you know, the yeah. yes but problem. Yeah. And uh, you, you, you teach the theory to people and they all get it, right? Everyone's intellectually got that, got that. As soon as you go on the role play, yeah. <laughs> within like two seconds, boom, out come all the but, but, but. It's just so ingrained in all of yeah. us. And this is Gaijin as well as Japanese, by the way, but just trying to change mindset for anyone is difficult. And so when you get into a foreign language too, it makes it even more difficult because yeah. it's not your native language. You don't have that scale of, of uh, sophisticated nuance that you have in your own native language. So it is, is a tricky one. Yeah. yeah. But that, you know, that, that's, it's, it's well, well worthwhile. There's some effectiveness in that. Uh, on the permission issue, that, that other case about the presentations with the company, there are prizes for that, for the best presentations, but there are also prizes for uh, valuable failures. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? It was, uh, okay. we, we were going to call it the Honorable Failure Award or something like that, but we actually came up with a much more positive name for it in the end. It was something a fighting like award, like from the sumo uh, or something. No, the, the, learning, the learning award or something like that. The learning like award, that. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Something good. like that. But, uh, yeah. but you know, that, that was a conscious effort to reward people for, you know. Who didn't do such the, a great job. Well, it, you know. They, they came up with an idea, and, and some of these ideas were actually executed, right? And some of them just didn't succeed. And you said, well, yeah, but look at all we learned from, from trying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, punch, yeah. punch, punch, you know, clap, yeah. clap, clap. And, and, and um, you know, that puts a whole different spin on things, you know, yeah, it does. for everybody. It does. Well, we, in Dale Cunningham, we have uh, no critique, yeah. you know, as a rule, no critique. And so we need to, uh, I mean, we didn't use the term psychologically safe environment until, I don't know, when did that, when did that term pop up uh, in the last... 20 minutes ago or something. Yeah, yeah. really. Yeah. That, that term is now everywhere, psychological safety, right? We didn't have that <clears> term before, but we had the concept. And Dale Carnegie, which is quite interesting to me, he had the concept from 1912 when he started in New York, mind you, which would have to be one of the least psychologically safe <laughs> uh, working environments you could possibly imagine, I would think, for a long time and possibly even still today. But he had that idea that we're going to give... Feedback, it's going to be what they're doing that's going well, working, it's good. How could they make it better? So in the make it better, there is a sort of a veiled critique, I guess. But it's yeah. not like, no, Eric, that's not good. You know, it's not that type of direct feedback that just kills your ego. But one thing I was thinking about with your island and your, your joining together is, you know, um, pre, pre, uh, pre Lehman and uh, pre-2011 with the... Uh, you know, earthquake, tsunami, triple nuclear meltdown, right? We had around about 80,000 young Japanese uh, going abroad to America every year. And uh, that then dropped right down yep. to about 50,000 a year. Yep. And over the last uh, number of years, it's crawled back up to sort of 60, 61. So that whole, all of those young people who would have become 
the sort of uh, interpreters of cultural differences, language difficulties that come into the workforce are no longer coming into the workforce. And so all of us who are relying on having English speakers, which, which you think about, it's crazy because Japanese companies realize, well, the domestic market's shrinking. We've got to buy companies outside of Japan if we're going to survive. So we need Japanese we can send overseas. At the moment, you need to send those young Japanese overseas. You don't have the supply coming in from overseas from study. So it's a bit of a, I think that whole issue around the getting to the island thing is going to be even more difficult going forward. Yeah, it is. Mm. Uh, we've, w one of our major initiatives right now in the, in the J Global uh, company is, is, is expat preparation. Right. Um, and it's, I mean, you've got all of this pent up expat travel, There's, you know, people on the launch pad waiting to go that have been, you know, sitting around for a year and a half and. Uh, so one of these days they're going to get they're going to finally get sent out and uh, they need to be prepared a lot of, mm. you know people some people you know don't do very well when they go abroad right they flounder yeah and uh, it's got to be preventable to some extent yeah well, I think you know it's a I, I give the example of uh, imagine uh, you're uh, in America working for a company and you're Japanese boss turns up, can't read any English at all, nothing, zero, cannot read any English, and only speaks to the two, three, four, five, however number it is, one, the people who speak Japanese. When you reverse it, you know, when you reverse it, think about that, you know, because that's the problem when you send foreigners here. They don't have a Japan background. They don't know the culture. They can't read the language. Can't read anything. You're illiterate in Japan. You're 100% illiterate, you know. Uh, and then you don't know. Then you find you got the couple of English speakers, and you, you know, you're hugging them tight. Sure. It's a tricky thing across cultures, across businesses to to succeed here. And so, you know, thinking about your your sort of cross pollination idea. Have you got any uh, things that would help to cross-pollinate for those foreigners who've got to be sent here and work here? Well, just one little sort of a operational example would be would be meetings. Right. Okay. A meeting meetings. Everybody does meetings, right? <laughs> Japanese meetings are so different from <laughs> from. Well, just describe a meetings. typical Japanese meeting for people who may not know what that looks like. Well, a Japanese meeting is is likely to be the purpose is different. You know, you, you, the meeting is generally not to decide things or to think up things. It's to report things, mm -hmm. and so they take on the the function of a ceremony sometimes more than anything else. And so you know, you sit. Everybody sits there. Nobody talks, and somebody reports on what's happened and. And, uh, and then you end and everybody leaves and it's all kind of weird, right? To, if you're a foreigner sitting in the thing. Yeah. And what the foreigner may not realize is, is that the decisions either have already been made elsewhere in some kind of a Namawashi situation or... Namawashi being groundwork. Groundwork. Uh, we you know, created a meeting, yeah, meeting all the people are going to be in the meeting, lobbying, right. getting consensus, and we will go into the meeting with the decision basically right. agreed. Or, alternatively, it, it, what, what, the, what the foreigner thought was going to be a decision-making meeting was just some sort of a, a set-up discussion, and the Japanese members of the meeting will then go off after the meeting and make the decision <laughs> and leave the foreigners out, hmm. not even consult them. Mm. Um, pretty frustrating, you know, for the for the foreigners involved, and you know, they eventually find out what's going on, and of course they they go crazy, right? Uh, so there there's a way to to do what we would call a hybrid meeting, right? Mm -hmm. That's and, and so you you know you 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 have some reporting functions in the meeting, but but if well, first of all, you clarify what the meeting is for mm -hmm. ahead of time for everybody mm -hmm. and make it super, super explicit. All right. And that's something... So what do you say? This is a decision-making meeting or this is a, a reporting meeting exactly. or this is an informed meeting or something like that. And no? at the end of the meeting, we will have done X. Right. So it's an outcome. Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, then you have a, and then you have an agenda, mm -hmm. which may, re may involve some reporting. It may involve some other stuff, but, but you keep to the agenda. You appoint a timekeeper. You, you know, you, you, you just sort of run things um, 
without a lot of assumptions. You know, mm. you, you know, the foreigners will run meetings with with their assumptions, and it, to Japanese, it just looks like chaos. It's people yelling over each other all the time, and the, and the Japanese have no idea how to how to insert themselves or participate or meaningful meaningfully to contribute to a meeting like that. Typical robust Western meeting where right. we duke it out in the room. Exactly. And so Japanese are just completely lost with that. And, and, and then the, the, the Japanese meeting we discussed before. So, you, you know, and, and neither of those types of meeting needed a, an explanation beforehand because everybody thinks they know what's going to go on. But when you've got two cultures in the same meeting, you know, those, you've got to not have those assumptions. You have to make everything a little bit explicit. Hmm. And uh, that r- runs against the grain in Japan because they, they love things to be implicit, you know, and unspoken. But, but uh, you, you know, you have to get out of that habit a little bit. And, and the foreigners can't just go wild and do whatever they, whatever they want all the time, right? So they, they have to adhere to a, a certain schedule. So, you know, everybody gives a little bit up mm-hmm. and everybody gains something and everybody learns some, some new skills uh, to, to get, make this thing work. But in the end, it works and you, and you get stuff done. It is difficult, isn't it? Because we've all been brought up in the rough and tumble of meetings and within corporations, you know, everyone's got sharp elbows, you know, that type of thing. And so there's a lot of ego and a lot of positioning going on, a lot of politics going on in big corporations when you're in those meetings with people trying to make things happen. So, uh, and particularly we're dealing with uh, Engineers, for example, uh, senior engineers from overseas who have become leaders through their organizations are extremely logical and, you know, they're very aggressive in the sense from a Japanese point of view. They just think they're, they're being assertive, but actually it's aggressive from a Japanese point of view. And the Japanese are just not even present. They're just wiped out. They don't even open their mouth because they're terrified of getting into that, oh, that yeah. brawl, what they see as a brawl. So it's quite difficult, isn't it? No, it would... would Interest, amuses me, I guess, is that both sides consider the other side to be immature. Oh, right. Okay. So yeah. the Japanese think the, 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 the foreigners are acting like children because yep. they, you know, they have no discipline, they have no self-control. And the foreigners look at the Japanese and they think they're like children because they, they have no agency, you know, they have no... No presence. No presence, no, no ability to, 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 you know, stick up for themselves and act, mm. act like proper adults. Mm. And it's a, you know, it's a ridiculous situation. But, mm. So it, it, it's good. We, we, we advise people to, on both sides to, to when, you, when you get confused by a situation, if you start to feel lost, is just ask what's going on. Mm. Just what do you mean by that? What, what, what's, what's, what's the uh, intention behind this? And, and people may wonder why you're asking such a silly thing, but they'll generally answer. I guess that also you've got to train people on how to ask that question yeah, because, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. I'm growing up in Australia. It's a very laid back country with a very direct communication style and no BS communication style in Australia. So if you're using that direct style with the Japanese audience, that's just like, whoa, you know, way too direct. So even asking what you mean by that or what's behind that has got to be coached in terms which I think are going to be yeah. a little bit uh, less strident than what we'd be used to. Well, you, you can ask it in a polite way, or, uh, sure. But, yeah, that does – people need to be trained to do that. We, 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 we have – Modules in, in our training and how to interrupt. <laughs> how to interrupt, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's skills to do that, you know, yeah. there are various ways. Yeah. And you just teach Japanese people to do You make them practice it. You know, you do role plays. And, you know, they, people can learn, right? I was reminded that there was a, a movie about Margaret Thatcher, which I saw, and uh, they've got the British cabinet lined up. They're all men, of course. And it's this long table of cabinet ministers, and she's right down the end because she's the new minister, the woman. And they're talking and they're wrapping everything up. <laughs> and she's, she's breaking into the meeting to get her idea onto the cabinet table for discussion, you know. And uh, it was very much highlighted, you know, that she had to really struggle yeah. to get her point into that because they've basically come to a decision, wrapped it up, and now she's got to break in 
and interrupt them as and a get her yeah. as a woman, yes, yeah. and this is going back, you know, before, before she became prime minister. So that was, uh, I was sort of reflecting on that. When I saw that movie, I thought, oh, that's very typical for Japanese in a robust Western meeting trying to make a point or have an opinion or, or even have an alternate opinion, not even disagreeing, just having an option, you know, something different. So what about trust? Think about trust. What have you found that works to gather, gather trust in Japan behind the leader? What have you, those 20 years you're in that company, your own company, how do you build trust? Well, uh, you know, what, what, what you're doing, I guess, as a leader is, is you're asking somebody to give up some agency, really. Um, what does that mean, give up some agency? Well, you, Let's say, uh, here's a, as an analogy, let's say uh, you know you you need to get to the airport. Uh, you put you you decide that I'm I'm not responsibility for the I'm not responsible for the mechanics of getting to the airport. I'm going to entrust that to uh, a taxi driver, mm -hmm. and the taxi driver uh, then assumes responsibility for getting you to the airport. Mm -hmm. So you've given up that little bit of agency to the to the cab driver. Mm -hmm. And Would you call that delegation? You're saying delegation? Kind of, uh, is this? Yeah, I guess delegation or, or you know, uh, delegation sounds kind of uh, top down, but this is the other way. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you call it going the other way. It must be a word for it that I can't pin down right now. Well, how does but, it work bottom up there? Well, you, you, you're, you're saying, you know, you're, you're as an employee, you're putting your kind of career, your work life into the hands of, of the leader of a company. Right. Right. And the, and so the, the, the company or your, your leader is kind of responsible for getting you through your career the way a taxi driver would get you to the, to the airport. Right, I see. Okay. And, so to, but, and to, so to get trust, if you're going to trust the cab driver, first of all, you want him to not be like insane or something. So, so he's got to have a certain character to him. You know, he has to exude confidence and, and that sort of thing. He has to demonstrate that he knows what he's doing. Uh, Which eliminates a lot of cab drivers in Tokyo. Oh, yeah, who don't, don't know have, where anything is anymore. Yeah, well, so, so. I mean, they used to know that, but they don't see it. doesn't matter anymore. anymore. They all have Navi. So, well, they can't even use the Navi. A lot of them drive you crazy. You've got to tell them where to go. You know? <laughs> but they, don't, they no longer throw up their hands and say, sorry, I just yeah, don't well, know. That's true. Take that's, the next cab. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Guide you. Get out of my cab. You know? yeah. um, so... so you need to uh, the the person. So as 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 a as as the passenger, and I'll I'll, I'll beat this metaphor into the ground if you don't mind. Uh, I, I need to know that the cab driver has my best interest in mind. That that right. he, that that he's committed to getting me to the airport. Right. That that's what he wants to do. Right. And that he's gonna. Get me there, kind of no matter what. If, right. if some little obstacle comes up, he's going to still do his best to get me to the airport. Right. And uh, also, you know, the competence thing. So if, if you have a choice, gee, am I going to take the expressway or the side roads because it's crowded? You know, I, I need to trust him to make that that decision correctly. Uh, and and so so it's 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 a combination of uh, you know concern. Uh, you know, being committed to 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 um, they talk about servant leadership, which is a yep. term I don't like a whole lot. But service yeah, I'm not leadership, on it either, but I get service the idea. leadership makes a bit more sense to me. Mm. Uh, so, so you're you're you know you're kind of doing something for 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 an employee because they've they've given you something, they've they've entrusted you with something mm -hmm. that's pretty valuable to them. Mm -hmm. And you, you're then, as a leader, responsible for that. You just yeah, are. that's interesting because that's a very opposite concept to the West, where bosses do not have that same sense of accountability, responsibility for their employees. Is that true? Well, I think these days they expect you to take accountability for yourself, uh, motivate yourself, work hard. You know, I have a responsibility to set the direction. I'm going to run the company. But I don't like. In, I I get what your point is. In Japan, it's a bigger responsibility because you have got that uh, agency of care for their careers, for their family as part of the company. 
But I think it's a bit more uh, independence oriented in the West, isn't it? Well, Speaking yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, as a leader, I'm not saying I'm responsible for spoon feeding people. Okay. Uh, right. I'm, I'm just, you know, but, but they've entrusted certain things to me, mm -hmm. which is like leadership of the company. Mm hmm. You know, if they've joined a company, they, they want the company to be healthy. They don't want, they don't want me to drive the company into the ground. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't see that they're expecting me to drive every step of their career. I mean, right. they, they've got their own things to do on mm -hmm. that. But, but, but they do need to trust in my basic competence as, mm -hmm. a, as a leader of the company. Mm -hmm. And that I do care about them. And, and this is where some Western leaders do fall down, and I think to their detriment. To the mm. detriment of the companies, and the good leaders in the in the, in, the, in in the states aren't like this, right? Mm. They 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 do uh, you know evidence some concern about the welfare of their mm. of of their uh, their people, right? Mm. Uh, if it's if it's not the CEO, certainly a you know a team leader would, mm -hmm. wouldn't they? In the states, I mean, I don't know. I don't I've know. Worked I haven't there. worked in the states, but my impression of is uh, sort of very. Uh, vigorous competitive landscape where you're climbing over the bodies to get yeah, to the top I, and the, I, yeah, the I, people I think are the robots who come in to make your glorious career go faster, smoother, higher. Yeah, That's I think my you've impression. Been, you, you might have been watching too many movies. But. Maybe I have. Maybe I have. <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street type maybe of movies. Maybe I have. Maybe I have. <laughs> no, maybe I'm are, a cynical Aussie. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but, but that's – you know, but, but coming around to trust, that, that's what it's all about. It's mm. – it's, it's, uh, you know, people have have to trust that you have the ability and uh, the, the 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 interests of the of the of the person who's trusting you at heart. I guess, mm. and so that requires a certain amount of transparency, mm -hmm. a, a, a fair amount of authenticity. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't you can't bullshit your way through all this sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, a certain amount of competence, you know, you have mm. to actually be able to deliver something. Mm. And um, it, you know, when if you circle back to branding, you know, you know, if, if you set a direction for the company mm -hmm. in the form of a brand, which is the mm. way I like to think about it, because that's my business. Um, the, the the leader has to really walk that walk that talk. Mm. You know, if if if. Uh, you know, if it's a matter of answering that strategic question, you know, or is this making people blue? I think particularly also as a foreigner, because we have to remember everyone is watching the yeah, boss. Yeah. You know, I say we are all absolutely highly skilled boss watchers in our careers. The boss's wrinkle in the forehead, the, the gait yeah. changes. We are sensitive to any any variation in their manner because we might think, well, maybe I'll bring that project up tomorrow, not today, because I don't think that's a good day for the boss to do that, or, or the boss is angry, or the boss is happy. I mean, we're all, globally, I think we're very good at being boss watchers, but I think particularly here too, because yeah. we're not culturally the same. Our clues are not the same. I think Japanese are spending a lot more time analyzing us to try and pick up on signals uh, that might, would be different signals that a Japanese leader would perhaps have. Right, so that's, that's why it's probably important here to open yourself up a little bit consciously mm. deliberately mm. Uh, so uh, give give those people something to hang on to because mm. they're not going to they might not read you properly if you just act your normal way because mm. mm. you, you're, you're giving out western cues that, the, that, yeah. they, that they may misinterpret right yeah not getting it yeah uh, so you have to be a little bit more explicit mm. a little bit uh you know and maybe more open than you'd normally be mm -hmm. and that's where the you know the, the going out and drinking and stuff kind of mm. comes in a little bit mm. i mean it's all mm -hmm. A bit of a, a chore sometimes, but it's it's yeah. uh, kind of important. I what guess. about building culture, Eric? Have you found anything that works particularly well in, in addition to what you've already talked about that you would specify, say, trying to build a culture in the company? Okay, well, then I'm going to uh, toot my my one horn again. Is is culture is determined by brand? Brand right, okay. comes first. <laughs> culture is a lagging indicator of of brand. Culture so is a lagging indicator of brand. Yeah. Okay. So if you get the brand right. And and that includes, let's say, the values. I'm, I think values, I mean, personally, I think values get a little bit overvalued, and the brand proposition gets undervalued. But that's, you know, not important. Uh, but you have those those things together. You have that basic promise, and you have some values. And uh, if if you're 
straight about those, if you're, if you're detailed and, and conscious about those things, and you know, you, you've got your strategic question that you ask all the time, so everything that you do is, is on, on point toward that, toward that brand proposition, culture is gonna take care of itself, hmm. pretty much. Hmm. Same thing with reputation. Reputation is also a lagging indicator of brand to me. Mm, okay. You mean personal or company or both? Company's reputation. Company-driven personal reputation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what's your definition of, of leadership? <laughs> a leader is, is, is somebody somebody follows. <laughs> Very simple definition. Very good. It's, it's, it's how do you get people to follow you. It's how do you get people to follow you, yeah. yeah. And you talked a little bit about some of the things for people to be aware of when they come to Japan to run a business here. You know, if you're going to give some some you know advice in addition to what you've already said about, okay, uh, please go to Japan, take over the operation, run it there. They don't speak the language, they don't know the culture. What would be some advice you'd give to someone new to Japan? Gee, I guess to take a little bit of time to to learn something about Japan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the uh, one of my uh, co-leaders in my my committee in the American Chamber, the, uh, she's Catherine uh, Gronauer. She 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 runs a cross-cultural advisory, so, and she she's got some data. She she said that the on on the average, uh, foreign managers will be here for three point something years before they come to her about cross-cultural advice, which is kind of an amazing statistic. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's if it's you know holds across the board, uh, it's something people ought to be doing kind of right away. Mm -hmm. If it takes people three years to figure, oh my goodness, I'm kind of lost here. I, I should I should start figuring this out. I mean that's awfully late, you know, awfully bloody late. I've got a great uh, metaphor for Japan. Uh, you you land in Japan and you arrive in this lake. It's a warm lake, so it's not freezing cold, but there is a, a fog over the lake. It's a warm lake with a very heavy mist. And you can sort of hear noises and you see rough shapes, but you can't make anything out. And then in your second year, it mist lifts a little bit and you're swimming around and you say, oh, yeah, there's an island over there. Yeah, okay, oh, there's a tree there. Uh -huh. And uh, but still not quite clear. It's still a bit misty. You just you sort of see better now. Then year three, all the fog goes away and you start to get an idea and then you leave for your next uh, post. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a pretty... Just as you get it right, it's like, well, time to come out. Now we're sending you to Russia or something. This is what we always said. It takes three years for a manager to, to become effective here and that's when they send them away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, learning about why Japanese business is run in a different way, even if you're running a, a foreign operation, Knowing about that stuff is going to really help you out because it's going to tell you why people act the funny ways they do in a lot of mm. cases. It'll save you an awful lot of time mm. if you just uh, sort that out. Uh, another one would be, you know, talk to people an awful lot. Uh, you, you mentioned before people, people have a, a tendency to, to hold fast to the, to the few English speakers around me. I used to call that uh, a military guy I, I met a long time ago, called, it, called that the talking dog syndrome. Mm. You, know, you, you, you promote the guy that can speak English, but that's all he can do is talk. You know, he's mm -hmm. got no other mm. ability, right? Um, so, but but talk talk to people, you know, and if you can't communicate directly in a language you speak, get an interpreter or find some other way to do it. But mm. but talk to people and listen, 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 mm. listen, because mm. people will tell you stuff. You know, if you mm. ask them, mm. usually people aren't so shy. Yeah, and if you if you uh, Show some concern. People will, will open up pretty well here. Um, the uh, another one would is yeah, is is just being you know just really walking the, the talk is is, mm -hmm. is is demonstrating do as you say you know mm -hmm. it, it, you, you just can't bullshit around here it's it, it's it's like you say people are finally finally attuned to oh, yeah. everything you're doing and you, you can't yeah. fake anything so. Should we learn Japanese? Should we bother learning Japanese? Well, you know, it depends on how long you're going to be here. It certainly wouldn't hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's worth the time you spend doing it um, mm -hmm. is, is a calculus you got to make. Uh, any, any little bit helps. Mm. My cousin uh, was here for many years. Uh, she married an Englishman. And she never bothered to learn Japanese because she always thought she was only going to be here for a short period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so it won't be worth it. But it actually turned out she was here working, met her future husband, got married here, and so she actually spent an enormous long time in Japan, hardly spoke any Japanese at the end of it. You know, it was like, what a shame. But uh, I, the Japanese thing is, is tricky, isn't it? Like, you need to have some level of Japanese to get around, but to have a, a business conversation, unless you're really, really going for it, I, that's going to take a lot of work. There, there are times, even now, I mean, my Japanese is, is, is not great. I would have dealt with the Japanese situation a lot differently if I'd known I was going to be here for as long as I have. Right? Come as like, like everybody else, right? As well, right? You already speak um, Chinese. So. And, you know, yeah, yeah, on top of that. But that said, you know, I, I, I get along okay in Japanese, you know, I'm, uh, but if it's a sensitive business topic, there are times when I'd kind of prefer to, to, to not do that. Mm. Uh, to to either get an interpreter or you know, do something else, because it's it's going to cut you know a good twenty points off my IQ mm. speaking Japanese. Mm. It just that's where my Japanese is, mm. and um, well, Japanese and, and that's, tends to be that's very sometimes direct a, too. Our Japanese tends to be very direct because I said before we just yeah. you know you've got you've got a big vocabulary in English and you can have lots of nuance, yeah. but when you've got a smaller vocabulary in a foreign language, the nuance is yeah. out the window. Well, that's my 20 points of IQ. Yeah, yeah. You've, got, you've got no... Right no. there, yeah. And so I'm happy to, you know, to chat with a, a client in Japanese and do all that, but if it's something really, really sensitive, uh, you know, you got to gotta know your limitations. Mm. So, yeah, the whole language thing is, is, is tricky, but... And, and that's all case by case. It's how long you're here, you know. Exactly. It's a calculation. How, yeah. how, how, how much English speaking happens in your company. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all, you, there's no one answer to that question. No answer to that. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, going to be universal. Mm. Well, thank you, Eric. This has been great. Fabulous to have you. Yeah, a lot of fun. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So join us again for our next episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews.